want to invite you to take your Bibles and join me in the book of Acts. Acts, uh, technically we are still in chapter 12, but it'll mostly be chapter 13. We're going to be in Acts 12, 25 through 13, 12. If you're using the, the blue ESV Bible and the, the seat backs out there, you can find our, pe- our text on page 921. The title of the sermon is Sent Off, and the keywords for our worshipers in training are Fasting, Cyprus, and Proconsul. Last week, we saw from Acts 12, from the, almost the whole of Acts 12, how God's kingdom continued to advance in the world in the days following the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Particularly, we saw it in the persecution that Herod uh, leveled against the church, the way that God sustained them in the midst of that persecution, rescuing Peter from prison, and then we saw the death of Herod as he arrogantly uh, basically took worship for himself from the people of Tyre and Sidon. What we've seen over and over again, really, in the book of Acts is that despite the many and severe attempts that the kingdom of man has made to destroy or thwart the kingdom of God, to thwart the church in its growth, the word of God continues, nevertheless, day in and day out, we read here, to increase and to multiply And the message of the cross and empty tomb continued to move out from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we saw um, the Lord begin to fulfill his promise in Acts 10 and 11 in particular to bring in the Gentiles formally into his kingdom. And today in Acts 13, we're going to see the church's first formal missionaries sent out. They're called and commissioned to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so let me read these verses beginning in 1225 all the way through 1312. Luke writes, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Paul and sought to hear the word of God. But Eliamus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the paths, the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him And he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Well, there are uh, two major uh, 
events and change, you know, uh, events, transactions that take place in this passage that I want you to see with me this morning. Um, and so we've really got just two main points. There's some sub points under each, and we'll try to tie it all together in the end. The first thing that I want you to see is uh, from verses 12:25 through 13:4. We see Barnabas and Saul set apart uh, as missionaries, uh, and John Mark was with them. And then secondly, in verses 5 through 12, we see the conversion of a Gentile man named Sergius Paulus, despite uh, some opposition from the kingdom of darkness. So look with me in the first place at 12, 25 through 13, 4, where we see Barnabas and Saul sent off as missionaries. We read in verse 25 of chapter 12 that they had returned from Jerusalem uh, to Antioch having completed their service regarding the gift offerings of the saints at Antioch to be distributed to those who came into need during the time of famine predicted by Agabus. And you can, uh, if you don't recall, that was the very end of chapter 11 where we read about the saints at Antioch sending gifts to the, to the church in Jerusalem to be dispersed by the elders through Barnabas and Saul. And so here, they've come back now to Antioch from their journey. And Luke says that at the church, in the church there in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, there was a man named Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, which was, he's the father of the Herod who had just died in Acts 12, the son of Herod the Great. And then you have Saul. So you've got this list of, of men, Barnabas, Niger, Lucius, Menaean, and Saul. And one day, while they and presumably the rest of the church were gathered, worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit says to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so, in response, they continued to fast. They committed themselves to prayer, and then uh, they laid their hands on them with a blessing and sent them off to do the Lord's work. And Luke writes in verse 4, so being sent off by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And there are uh, at least three lessons that we need to learn from these verses here in 25 through 13, 4. And I want to begin first with the the personhood of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke, we are told, to the church at Antioch. And the Holy Spirit sent out Barnabas and Saul. It seems that what happened here is that through one or perhaps several of the prophets named in verse 1, the Holy Spirit communicated to the church at Antioch his intention to use Barnabas and Saul for the missionary endeavor. They were to take God's word to the end of the earth. We saw uh, similarly the way that the Spirit would speak at this time through Agabus in Acts 11.28 that I mentioned earlier. We're told that he prophesied of a coming famine, uh, and he did so by the Spirit. And then Luke confirms that it did in fact take place. And so some combination of these men or all of these men or one of these men um, receive this word from the Spirit set apart Barnabas and Saul. If you ever wanted a passage of Scripture that highlights the personhood of the Holy Spirit, this would be one of them. One of the great misunderstandings that has plagued uh, many regarding the nature of the Holy Spirit concerns his very personhood. What I mean is that many people talk about the Holy Spirit like he is an impersonal force out there in the world. Some do this formally and heretically like the Jehovah's Witnesses that he is just in it, God's active force in the world, but I think others And perhaps we've been guilty of this ourselves. Do it somewhat informally, even accidentally, where, again, we allow the the neutral pronoun it to begin to slip in there, right? 
We don't have a, no one has, we don't have a formalized doctrine that impersonalized the Spirit, but often people will talk about him in similar ways, referring to the Spirit as an it. This passage is a great one that dispels any notion that the Spirit lacks personhood. God is triune. He is one being and three persons, as the historic formulation says. But why does it matter? Why bring this up now? Why should we focus on the the personhood of the Spirit? Well, if we allow ourselves to think of the Spirit, who is a member of the Godhead, in impersonal terms, we leave ourselves shortchanged at the very least in our communion with God. Friends, there is nothing impersonal about God. God is all personal. God is not just some force out there in the world, some non-personal entity like fate or uh, karma. God is not just some force that mechanistically runs the world from afar. God is an active personal being, and he calls each of us, as individuals, and he calls us as a church into a personal relationship with him. So, do you know God personally? Do you enjoy, another way to put it, do you enjoy friendship with God? With all three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I pray that we would, and this passage teaches us somewhat uh, in a roundabout way, but nevertheless, no, not, uh, not unclearly, that the Spirit is personal. The Spirit acts. And related to this is a second lesson to be learned here, and it regards the relationship between the church and the Spirit in the sending out of these missionaries. The question we could ask, who sent out Barnabas and Saul? Was it the church in Antioch that sent them out? Or was it the Holy Spirit who sent them out? Well, the answer is yes. Look at verse 3. Then after fasting and praying, they, the church in Antioch, with, led by the prophets and teachers, they laid their hands on them, Paul and Barnabas, and sent them off. Verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there sailed to Cyprus. According to Luke, it is both the church and the Spirit who sent these men out. And so, of course, this deepens our understanding, it should, of the the personhood of the Spirit, as we contemplate our relationship with God, and how, essentially, what we have to understand here is that He's working through means, Luke is not contradicting himself in the span of two verses. It's not as though he wrote that this church sent them off and then forgot immediately and said that it was the Spirit who sent them off. We understand that it was the Spirit working through the church to bring this about. So when it comes to the work of ministry in general, the calling of church leaders, the calling of missionaries, we must recognize and embrace and love the fact that we have a great responsibility in the matter. The church did not simply say, well, I guess we'll wait and see for when the Spirit sends them out. They, they prayed, they fasted, they laid their hands, and they sent them out. And yet, it was not ultimately for them to receive credit for this work. It's not as though the church at Antioch is to be so praised and um, lauded for their wisdom and their virtue in choosing these two men. Ultimately, it was the Spirit who chose the men, the Spirit who sent them out. You know, the, the Bible is often much less interested in explaining how the responsibility of man and the sovereignty of God work together than it is in simply stating that they do, in fact, work together. The Spirit is sovereign. We are responsible. So, 
for us here at RBC, when, when we think about ordaining elders and ordaining deacons to the work of ministry or sending out missionaries, do we appreciate the fact that it is the very work of God to which they are called and this very work of God in which we are engaged to send them out? I prayed for Steve and Maggie a few minutes ago before the sermon. Think about this. When we send you guys off to Romania in the coming months, it is not us alone, but the Holy Spirit sending them out. That is a wonderful thing and a weighty thing. And so the Spirit is personal. The Spirit works through His church to bring about His intended means. And I want to consider one last lesson here from this first heading. And it regards the work of the church, and in particular, that of prayer and fasting. If prayer has fallen on hard times in the Western church... I think fasting has fallen on harder times. Think about it. A bunch of Christians in the room. Rhetorical questions here. When was the last time you prayed? This morning? Last night? A week ago? When was the last time you fasted? Now, I don't mean like the intermittent fasting thing. Uh, or forgetting to eat breakfast and lunch because you're scrambling to rein your children in all day. I'm talking about a concerted effort to withstain from eating, fasting from food, in order to deepen your dependence upon God in your praying. In his book, Hunger for God, John Piper opens with this line. He says, the birthplace of Christian fasting is homesickness for God. Are you homesick for God, brothers and sisters? You know, we've, we've sought to encourage a, a bit more corporate fasting here at RBC in the past several months. Um, Regarding the pursuit of uh, additional elders and deacons here, regarding um, the Cordes and, and John's situation with cancer. And I pray that we can be doing that more in the future. But I want to think for a minute here about fasting and sort of what it is. And in principle, fasting is a way of seeking God purposefully, intentionally, seeking wisdom from God. Seeking guidance from God regarding some issue that we may live faithfully according to His will. When we fast, our hunger should drive us to an appreciation of our great need for God and His provisions for us. And yet, reading this passage might bring something to mind for you. Don't... What about Jesus when he says, don't let your fasting be seen by others? Doesn't he say something to that effect, you might think? Doesn't he rule out something like corporate fasting? If I'm going to fast, it's got to be in private? Well, Paul and the early church here in Antioch didn't seem to think so. Luke doesn't seem to think so. And neither should we. What Jesus forbids, you see, is an individual advertising his fasting in order to seek applause for himself. His fasting is not a means to communion with God. His fasting is a means to the praise of man. A church body committing to spend time together Fasting for the sake of greater fellowship and friendship with God. Uh, Fasting for the sake of increased unity among the brethren. Fasting for the healing of someone who is sick. Fasting for wisdom regarding important decisions that need to be made. Those are just a few examples. That is not what Jesus is condemning. He is condemning the self-righteous man who will fast and then wants everyone to know about it. 
And so he's constantly talking about how hungry he is. He's uh, looking disheveled and distraught. And then when you ask him what's wrong, he says, well, I just want you to know how spiritual I am. That is not what Jesus is talking about. And so the church here is gathered for prayer and fasting. And so let's ask ourselves some questions, right? When was the last time you fasted? Ever? Do you, do you fast as an individual? Do you fast perhaps as a family? Do we fast as a church? What if we really did begin to incorporate this practice that is nothing new, and nor is it something that is only weird and mystical, as many probably think that it is. It's really quite simple. But what if we did? What if we committed ourselves to greater levels of, of hunger for God? What wisdom, what insight, what guidance, what instruction, what fellowship, blessing, and Help might the Lord be pleased to impart to us through the means of such an endeavor. Right? Fasting is not magic. It doesn't guarantee this or that. But it does, when tied with prayer and dependence upon God, it does place us directly in the firing line, so to speak, of God's grace. You know, as I said a minute ago, or not a minute ago, it was many minutes ago, at the beginning of the service, we have our fellowship meal today. We have a monthly fellowship meal. Every, the last Sunday of the month, we come together and have lunch. And I love it. What if we had a monthly time of prayer and fasting? We do have a weekly time of prayer. Sunday mornings at 9 in the 500 building. But what are other ways we can work this into the life of our church? I want us as a church to be indescribably hungry for God. I think that many of us are individually. I think there's a growing hunger corporately. But I spend much time praying and longing that God would only make this increase. That God would grow our appetite for Him and that He would satisfy it fully over and over and over again. Think about it. What are the decisions that we're going to have to make as a church in the coming months or years? Some of them we may know. Some of them we may have think we know. But many of them perhaps we have no clue what will face us in the days ahead. How do we grow as a church? Not just in number, but in fellowship with God and in effectiveness in ministering here in our neighborhood. How can we become a church like the one described in Acts 17 uh, that turned the city upside down with the teaching of the gospel? How can we become that kind of church? What kind of prayerful dependence are we going to need to learn to exercise through prayer and fasting to become that kind of church? That you can't think of Effingham County or even perhaps the surrounding counties without thinking of the Lord Jesus. Perhaps we pray because in some small part of the way God would be pleased to use us. So the Holy Spirit is personal. He works through His church to bring about His appointed ends, and He calls us to, among other things, the labor of prayer and fasting. But we see also in this passage another event. Barnabas and Saul are sent out by the Spirit through the church. And then in, in verse 5, uh, we see them begin to minister on the island of Cyprus, and they are confronted by a false prophet. 
we're told in verse 4 that they get to Cyprus. Uh, and specifically, when we see in verse 5, the eastern coast city of Salamis. And they begin proclaiming the word of God um, to the Jews in the synagogues. And John Mark, we're told, was assisting them. We don't know the capacity in which he worked, but he was with them, helping. And they make it through the whole island, as far as Paphos, on the west coast. And they become so um, prominent, I suppose, so well known what was going on, that um, they were invited by this man, Sergius Paulus, to speak to them. But they encounter a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus, which means uh, his name uh, in one sense here, uh, like Bar-Jesus means son of salvation. Um, and it seems that this man, Bar-Jesus, had some job as an attendant with the Gentile proconsul. And Sergius, we're told, is a man of intelligence. And so he summons them. He wants to hear more. But, but Bar-Jesus, whom Luke also called Eliamus in verse 8, uh, he opposed them. Likely, Eliamus saw Barnabas and Saul and their ministry as a great threat to his livelihood, to his deceptions. And so he opposes them. But then Saul, who Luke also refers to as Paul, so um, it's just a side note about the name. I think sometimes people describe like Saul the Pharisee becomes Paul the Apostle, and it's, it's like he gets his name changed. But uh, that's not really what Acts tells us. What Acts tells us, or what we really should learn from it, is that he was Saul and Paul. One's a Hebrew name, one is a Greek name. And as he becomes increasingly this apostle to the Gentiles, he uses his Greek name, Paul. And so I, I think from here on out, he just refers to him as Paul. So Saul is no more um, as he begins to increasingly have influence in the Greek world. And so Paul is filled with the Spirit here at the opposition of this man, Eliamus, and he looks intently at him. I love what Luke writes. He looked intently at him. He was not pulling punches. He was not afraid. He was a man of courage, and he rebukes him. He delivers a rather devastating rebuke. He says, you are a son of the devil, not a son of salvation, as your name implies. You are an enemy of all righteousness. You are full of deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? He then curses Elimus with temporary blindness. And yet, the result of this, the proconsul believed. Seeing what took place because he was astonished by the teaching of the Lord. So what is the takeaway? Well, it's the same thing that we've been seeing over and over again all throughout the book of Acts. The kingdom of man does not stand a chance against the kingdom of God. We have seen God's power over the political forces of the day, but here we get a, an acute look at God's power over much more overtly spiritual and demonic forces of evil. We saw this a bit in Acts 8 with Simon the magician. We'll see it again in Acts 16 with a demon-possessed girl at Philippi who, um, I guess, can tell the future. You know, the Bible doesn't want us to look at things like witchcraft, and fortune-telling, magic, and wave it off, scoff at it. Assuming it's all simply a charade. Simon really did some wild things that amazed the people in Acts 8. The girl in Acts 16, like I said, has some ability through this demonic influence to prophesy. Now we're not told what the magician here does. We're not, t we're not told what his opposition looked like. Don't know if it was in word only or in using some sort of power, but he 
was attempting to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And, and if you listen to Paul's rebuke, he takes him very seriously. He doesn't say, you are merely pretending, you are scamming these people. He says, you are a son of the devil, making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. Friends, we live in an embattled world. And there is a growing mainstream fascination with occultism in our broader culture. And so it shouldn't surprise us in the days and weeks and months and years ahead if these kinds of people and these kinds of practices begin to continue growing in influence and popularity. So rather than assuming they're all sleight of hand tricksters or what have you, perhaps we need to take seriously the possibility that there are things out there with real power and they really oppose the Lord Jesus and the advancement of his gospel. And yet, as this passage makes plain, as does just about every other passage in Acts, you do not have to fear them. Jesus has put them to open shame. Over and over again, in this book of Acts, we are reminded of this simple fact. The kingdom of God marches on. James may be dead, as we saw in chapter 12. And of course, that is sad and devastating and grievous, but God's kingdom continues. The kingdom of darkness here made another attempt to thwart the kingdom of God. He wanted to turn Barnabas and Saul away. He wanted to keep the proconsul in the dark. He wanted Sergius to be locked up. And yet Paul was undeterred. He rebukes the wicked magician, curses him, and the result, faith in the heart of the proconsul. And so, we have another conversion here. It's worth asking who in your life is the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, trying to hold on to? Who is it that the devil is eager to keep bound in chains that you know? Friends, all it takes is but a word from the Spirit and off the chains will fall. The Spirit blinded the wicked magician here. He can just as easily bring light to darkened eyes like the proconsul if god has you on his list the devil cannot have you on his and so two things in closing here those who oppose the work of god belong to Satan. They are enemies of righteousness and they are marked by things like deceit and villainy. May it never be that we should be ones to make crooked the straight paths of the Lord. And so, I tremble to think that there would be someone here this morning like that. But if you are here opposed to God, be Warned, you are living as a child of the devil. And yet there is hope. Are you willing to repent and believe in the name of Jesus of Nazareth? No more excuses, no more delays, no more justifications, my friend. You may not be a false, prop, false Jewish prophet magician. But if you are resisting God, stop. Repent and believe. And then, more broadly, for, for the rest of us, let me tie these, these themes together here. There was a, a moment this week where I, I thought about separating these two sections and, and preaching just through verse 4. But as I, I worked and worked and worked and reworked, I, I realized that they, they needed to come together, and, and here's why. The, the commissioning of, of Barnabas and Saul... And their confrontation with Bar-Jesus has something in 
common. They have something in common with one another. Rhetorical question. Do you know what it is? It's the, the Holy Spirit. It is the same Spirit who inwardly calls Barnabas and Saul is the same Holy Spirit who sends them out through the worship, prayer, fasting, and laying on hands of the church. And it is the same Spirit with whom Paul is filled in verse 9. He empowers Paul to confront the man Eliamus in this embattled moment on Cyprus. So from start to finish in this passage, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus is at work. He is calling, equipping, sending, and empowering His servants to carry out the work that He gives them in order that His kingdom might continue to advance and expand into the remote parts of the world. So what do we do with that? Well, what is the work to which God has called us? Well, here's how we've stated our understanding of God's call upon us as a church, as a church here at Redeemer Baptist Church. Our mission statement says that we are a family of faith that exists to worship God with joy, to love our neighbors, to see transformed lives, and to send and be sent for the spread of the gospel through Jesus Christ. Friends. Fellow heirs of the grace of life, brothers and sisters, do you believe that through the power of the Spirit, we will, we will here at RBC worship God joyfully, love our neighbors with humble, wise, sacrificial, and compassionate hearts, that we would see transformed lives as God transforms us from one degree of glory to another as we behold the glory of Jesus Christ in His Word by the power of His Spirit, and that we will continue to send and be sent, whether it's across the street or across the globe, and it would all be for the glory of God. Do you believe that God has called us to these things? And if so, do you believe that He will equip us for these things? Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Final word. Rejoice, my friends. Fear not, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom.